and welcome to The Spectrum Show, a show dedicated to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Coming up in this episode, we go back to March 1984 to get all the Sinclair news and latest Spectrum game releases. We trace the roots of adventure games. We review some older games. And look at some newer titles. But first, it's back into the time machine and March 1984. Sinclair have admitted that any interest on payments received from its new delayed QL machine will go to the company and not the customer. There are over 9,000 customers still waiting to get the new machine that have sent payment to Sinclair, who now say that the machines will be delivered at the end of April, well past the 28-day deadline originally quoted. It's estimated that Sinclair will have around £1.8 million of customers' money, earning them something in the region of £32,000 interest. After a customer backlash, though, they backed down and offered compensation for those who had already paid in full, admitting that it was a development problem to blame, rather than the previously stated phenomenal demand. As reported last episode, the MOD have stepped in to stop an anti-piracy device from being sold to the public. The move has caused many companies to complain, and the Guild of Software Houses have demanded that, if the MOD still refuse to release the technology, they should at least compensate the companies for lost revenue. The follow-up to the successful adventure game The Hobbit has been delayed. The much-anticipated Sherlock will now be released in late May, according to Melbourne House. To fill the gap, though, another game has been released, showing some really nice graphics and a new style of gameplay. Muggsy has you playing an aspiring gangster, trying to take control of the neighbourhood. Liverpool-based software house Imagine have run into problems with their latest and much publicised contract. The company were to provide a series of games for publisher Marshall Cavendish to accompany a new magazine called Input. Imagine were to provide six games across five different computers, totalling 30 in all. The initial batch has been rejected by the publisher. Imagine, not happy with the state of things, claims that the contract has now been terminated, leaving them with several finished and several unfinished games to get rid of. Pedro is one of those games, and Imagine hoped to release it as a full title for the Spectrum, Commodore, Dragon, BBC and Electron computers. If things weren't bad enough, the rumoured fee paid by Marshall Cavendish, thought to be around half a million pounds, will now have to be paid back by Imagine over the next 12 months. Sinclair has announced that they are in the final stages of negotiations with Hoover to manufacture its first electric car. They hope the vacuum cleaner company will assemble the car in its Welsh factory, and that future cars, already planned by Sinclair, can also be built there. The plant was also the place where the famous DeLorean sports car was made, so those who believe in coincidences be ready. And that was the news for March 1984. And now on to the top selling games. There are not many new games this month, with old favourites still hogging the charts. Games like Attic Attack, The Hobbit, Ant Attack and Checkered Flag are refusing to move, leaving little room for newcomers. Really, the only game that's making headway is Scuba Dive from Jurel, a deep sea treasure collecting arcade exploration game. And that was the news and games from March 1984. Adventure gaming began in 1976, when William Crowther created the very first text-based game written in a language called Fortran. The game was loosely based on a large cave system that he had explored as a caver, and was created on a PDP-10 mainframe. Shortly after, Don Woods found the game, and with Crowther's blessing, he expanded it into what is now known as Colossal Cave, the grandfather of all adventure games. The game was purely text-based, and accepted one or two word commands to guide the player through the various puzzles in a bid to collect all the treasure within the cave and return it safely to the house. From this single game spawned every other adventure game, and it was no surprise that when home microcomputers came along in the early 80s, people would begin to write their own versions and create new variants. Because the game was text only, it meant that almost any micro could be used, as long as it had enough memory to hold the parser, the objects, locations and mechanics of the game. The Spectrum had several versions of the classic, notably Adventure 1 from Abasoft, which was later bought and published by Melbourne House under the name of Classic Adventure, and of course Colossal Adventure by Level 9. Amongst the first wave of adventures, the ones that stood out were probably the ones from Arctic Computing. Their initial set proved very popular, frequently entering the top 10 despite some very dodgy actions that could be performed on a female android in one particular game. 
Magazines too jumped on the bandwagon, offering hints for frustrated and lost adventurers. The only problem raised was that sometimes the game proved difficult, not because of the actual challenges, but because the player had to guess the correct wording. For example, if you wanted to pick something up, do you use collect, get, take, etc, etc. The parser had to be improved to make gaming more accessible, providing easier and different ways of doing the same thing, so that it didn't leave the player frustrated. Text-only games relied heavily on the imagination of the player, much in the same way that a book does, but with the advancements in computing it wasn't long before graphics began to creep in. Initially there were poor line-drawn squares relegated to a small area of the screen, but as time went on they slowly improved, filling the top section of the screen, and in some cases the whole of the screen. The major jump in advancement came in 1983, when Melbourne House released The Hobbit. This game completely changed adventure gaming, providing a complex parser and rich graphics, coupled with a good story and large vocabulary. Like Colossal Cave before it, The Hobbit spawned a multitude of coppers. The range of topics in these games were vast. They covered pirates, hooligans, sleuths, everything you could imagine was put into an adventure game format. Because adventures did not really rely on specific hardware requirements, they could be ported across many machines, and soon players could enjoy the same game on different micros. Adventures began to grow and well-known scenarios soon arrived, taking ideas from films, comic books and television. There's always been a niche market for adventure games, and a company called Jillsoft wanted to take advantage of this, and so it launched their utility called The Quill. This allowed people to create their own text-based games, and it wasn't long before the market was flooded with homemade adventures. Later on, a graphics add-on was released, allowing graphics to be added. Of course, now with text and graphics, the next step was animation. Not only did we get text and graphics, but moving images as well, all to enrich the experience. These usually took form of small animated characters, like those in Valhalla, for example, or scenes to move the plot forward, like those found in Scott Adams' games. Slowly, the textual element adventures had been roaded away at, until we reached a new game genre, the arcade adventure. Text input in these games were reduced significantly, or eliminated altogether, as the player now relied on the graphics to portray the action, with just a few simple text prompts where needed. There were also people willing to experiment. One notable game was Slain. Here, the player's thoughts drifted around the screen and had to be selected and used when required. Quite intuitive, but difficult to control without a mouse, and it never really caught on. With all these new features, the games themselves could seem restricted, especially in size, but some games just grew to enormous proportions despite the limitations on offer. For example, Lords of Midnight boasted 32,000 views, and although leaning towards role-playing, it was still part of the adventure family. The level 9 game Snowball also claimed 2,000 plus locations by using a clever text compressor. Eventually it got to the stage though where games were only limited by the hardware they were running on. And to get around this, several companies began to think about supplying an expansion unit. Shadow of the Unicorn from Microgen is probably the only one that made it to release. This game came with a 16k ROM expansion, allowing more data to be stored. Imagine were famously working on a similar concept with their much publicised but never completed Bandersnatch. It seemed that the limitations of the spectrum were holding adventures back, and the genre had gone as far as it could go, at least on the 8-bit machines. Some companies like Magnetic Scrolls and Level 9 still put out quality adventure games though, relying on atmospheric text and complex gameplay. But the adventure game days were over, along with the spectrum sadly. Luckily, for any avid adventure fans, the spectrum and the genre is not completely dead. Adventures are still being released, albeit slowly. The game format has come a long way from its early text-only days, but some say you still can't beat the imagination when it comes to adventures. You just can't beat the graphics in the text-only game.
Road Blasters is another in a long line of arcade conversions from US Gold. The arcade version took ideas from several other games, like Pole Position and Spy Hunter, and threw them together in what could easily be called Mad Max or even 3D Spy Hunter. There is not much of a plot, but then again who really needs one when the idea is to drive around, survive and shoot everything. There is an added twist in that you only have a certain amount of fuel, and you have to keep your eye on this as it runs out pretty quickly. You can replenish this fuel by collecting orbs or reaching checkpoints. Coupled with this are the other vehicles that you have to shoot and roadside cannons that for most of the time miss you but tend to be on target just when you don't need them to be. You can take these out by clever driving and angling your car just right but it does take practice. The driving aspect is good with a nice feeling of speed and responsive controls. The angle of your car changes as you take corners meaning that you can fire in different directions, something that can be used to your advantage as mentioned earlier. You can also collect weapons and power-ups like nitro boost or missiles. Every now and again you'll get a mine warning and you have to avoid mines placed in various lanes. Initially I thought the game was, for me at least, a little too difficult in the early stages meaning for someone not accustomed to the controls or gameplay would find it tricky. It was then that I realised I'd got the game set to medium instead of rookie. Putting it on this mode provides a much more welcoming game and a nice learning curve. This is a great game with nice smooth graphics and good sound, and certainly one of the better arcade conversions to be attempted. Obviously it can't match the arcade, but it's still definitely worth trying. Bear Bother was released in 1983 by Arctic Computing and is an early John Rittman game. John went on to bring us classics like Batman, Match Day and Head Over Heels, but this game is a few years before those though and has much more simplistic gameplay. It's a cross between several other games, notably Panic and Burger Time. The idea is that Ted has just bought his brand new Sinclair electric truck and wants to take it for a drive, but he realises that there aren't any batteries. He then notices some batteries up on some scaffolding and sets off to collect them. Of course it's not as easy as that and there are several things out to stop him. Yes, it's pretty much a burger time clone with bears. The graphics are large and nicely coloured, the sound is good with a happy little tune playing, but it soon gets annoying. And I'm sure that I could turn it off back in the 80s, but reading the instructions I couldn't find anything. After some random key pressing I found out that pressing 1 turns the sound off altogether, pressing 2 just enables the sound effects, and pressing 4 brings the music back on. Another problem is if you select baby bear mode, which makes you invulnerable just so that you can get used to the gameplay, you can't really get back to start a proper game. What you have to do is press H and then wait until the menu comes back round again, and then select the proper game mode. As each battery is collected, the truck moves a little further across the screen until it eventually reaches the other side and the next level begins with different platform layout, sorry, different scaffolding layout. You can disperse the chasing nasties by dropping batteries on them or leaving a time bomb in their path. These are very limited though, so you have to use them with care. There are various bonuses to collect and some special guest enemies, one of them being Jetman. Unfortunately I just couldn't play the game long enough for him to appear, but I definitely saw him back in the 80s wandering about. Overall the game is a good Burger Time clone, but the pace is a little slow, but it's still tricky to get things right. If you like the aforementioned fast food game, then this might be right up your street, otherwise it's a fair game that you may like or hate depending on your gaming preferences. I enjoyed it when I originally bought it, and I still find it good for a quick play now and again. Nightmare ZX, released in 2012 by Climacus, is the Spectrum version of a Konami game originally released on the MSX computer. The game had many conversions for other platforms, but not the Spectrum, until now. The game is somewhat of a strange mix, but at its heart it's a good old shoot 'em up Popolon, the main character, wants to, shall we say, get to know Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of love, but she toys with his affections and demands that he prove himself by going on a dangerous mission. 
Then, of course, she goes and gets herself kidnapped, leaving our hero with nothing to do but rescue her. Now, the story doesn't sound very much like a shoot 'em up, and my initial impressions was that it was some sort of Ikari Warriors type game, and straight away rushed forward to make some progress. This was a bad mistake. This is a shoot 'em up, and we all know the best policy is to stay low, giving you enough time to react and shoot the enemies. The colourful backgrounds depicting temples and other Greek landscapes slowly scrolls down and things at first seem a little pedestrian, but it doesn't take long before it hots up and you soon find yourself blasting away. There are power-ups to collect of course, and the obligatory end of level boss fights. The game is 128k only, and has some nice music and effects, and control is responsive. It's very rare we get shoot 'em up from the spectrum these days, so this was a pleasant surprise, and a great game. Definitely worth checking out. That's the end of this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to help make in the next one, get in touch via the details below. See you soon.